Hello, everyone, and welcome to another of my Tabletop Gaming Lectures. I am game designer Jason Bowman. Uh, I'm the director of game design at Paizo and the creator of the Pathfinder role-playing game. And today, I want to talk to you about making maps. Uh, mapping has always been a kind of one of my favorite tasks in part of, of making adventures or making modules. Uh, mapping is something near and dear to my heart. I have uh, uh, a degree in architecture, so drawing maps has always been something I've enjoyed, uh, and those skills have served me well to this day. Uh, I find that mapping is a really critical part of the tabletop role-playing game experience. Uh, more so than in many other, uh, uh, you know, uh, types of entertainment, obviously, uh, because a map is critical. It's the framework by which the GM tells the story. It is actually a physical constraint that helps both the GM and the players interact with the world and the tale. Um, it, it is an oddly specific critical component to making tabletop role-playing games work. Uh, you know, without a good map, the players don't have a good sense of space, where they can go, how they can interact with it. The GM doesn't know how the neighboring uh, encounter areas operate, how it all fits together. Maps end up being this ridiculously critical component, yet um, you will find that most RPG books don't bother going into, like, the hows and whys of making good maps at all. But don't worry, I got you covered. So uh, in, in, in most fantasy RPGs, and I would say that, that in, in you know, science fiction and horror RPGs, this is true as well, but in some cases to a lesser extent. But in fantasy RPGs in particular, designing a good map uh, goes hand in hand with designing good encounters. Um, you know, I, I think we've all had those encounters where you open up a door, it's a square room, there's an orc in the middle. Maybe he has a pie. Maybe he doesn't. Uh, and uh, he's clearly just standing around there waiting for you to fight him. And that's the encounter. And while that certainly counts as an encounter, the space isn't giving you any help there. Because it's it's a component of that, right? Uh, oh, it's just a square room. All right, well, that, that's a thing. Uh, even if you take that, that same orc and put him at the top of a flight of stairs with ledges around him and columns to hide behind and dodge around, the encounter itself just got twice as interesting to participate in just by some extra doodles on the map. It's that sort of thing that makes maps rather uh, critical. Um, they can help give an encounter life. They can add a dynamic space things for the players to interact with, things to spark their imagination, things that allow them to use their abilities and skills. The same goes for monsters, right? Take up a, a powerful dragon and put it in a confined space where it can't fly around or do anything, and you have a much different encounter than if you take that same dragon, put him out in the middle of an open field or, or, or down the side of a mountain where he can soar past, breathe all over you, and circle around to do it all over again. That's what makes the map a critical part of the story. And that gets me to part one. Part one is what is the map's story? So the first step in creating a great map is designing the story that that map needs to contain, right? Um, what is the purpose of the map? Um, you know, what, what, what types of encounters are you trying to cram into that space? Um, and, 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 you know, it, that can start out really simply, right? You know, you can start out with something really, really, really basic, uh, to form the, the foundation of your maps. Most maps do start out as something really simple. You have some nugget of a story, you know, you need some spaces for these encounters to occur. And it's almost like a flow diagram at that point, right? You're just kind of saying this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. And as you're doing that, you're going, okay, well, what kind of space do I need for this encounter to work? How much do, does this encounter work better in a tight, confined space? Does it need a big space? Does it need terrain changes? Things like that. Those, those are some of the things you're going to think early on. But, but even then, you're, you, the, the urge is to get ahead of yourself, to start scribbling out, you know, columns and stairs and statues. Hold off on that. 
you, there'll be time. There'll be time. But first, you want to start out with just kind of, what are my encounters? How do they relate to each other? How do the parts of the narrative inherently relate to each other? And how does that translate to how they physically interact? Do these two things need to be in next to each other? Do the guards that uh, are, are watching over the tomb of the, of the undead tyrant they obviously need to go right outside the door. Otherwise, they're not really guards. So, okay, I know those two things need to go together. But maybe there's a, a different thing with the Undead Tyrant Seneschal. That can go in a whole different area. So maybe I'll put it in a different spot, right? So what it starts out with is you mapping out your encounters and starting there. Now, I, I do want to take a small aside and say that I know that there are folks out there who draw a really cool map and then fill it with a really cool dungeon. That is totally a valid way of making dungeons. I have seen people do it to great success. And in some ways that can help spark the imagination when you're stuck. That's not the way I design dungeons, but it, it is a valid way of doing it. It's not my way. Might be, might work for you. In which case, uh, you, you pretty much run this tutorial kind of in reverse, but that's okay. Um, so you start out with the encounters, you uh, create them as a series of interrelations. Uh, to form the most kind of basic version of the map. At, at this stage, uh, the map is little more than a diagram of encounters. So I've got an example for you. I've done some prep work beforehand just so that I could show you something so you understand what I'm saying. Because maps are inherently visual, so it's good to, to, good to have an understanding. So let's say I've got a small town uh, that is near uh, the, 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 the cobweb mines. And it's called the cobweb mines because uh, it was an old cave, uh, but since then it's been filled with spiders. Nobody likes to go there. It's, it's old, it's ancient. It's not really been much of a nuisance until recently. The farmer who lives right nearby uh, has been reporting that these spiders have been coming out and, and many of them have uh, like they're, they have like auras of flame around them and they're, they're crawling around setting the crops on fire and causing chaos. The only place anyone knows where there are spiders are from this mine. And so that's the kind of seed of your adventure. You know, you've got these spiders. They usually live in this mine, but something has changed. And now the spiders have this weird elemental power. So I, I know I'm going to have some encounter with spiders. I know, uh, thinking about my story, what's really going on there is that this was an old uh, dwarven wizard's workshop uh, that is buried in the bottom of this place. And uh, something in it has woken up and its elemental power is running amok. Uh, and that is empowering these spiders. So I know there's a few other things I'm going to need. I know I'm going to want something with elementals to kind of near the spiders to start uh, kind of enhancing them. And from those, you can lead your way into the workshop. But maybe I don't want you to just jump right in. Maybe there should be like some traps or some guardians or something. It's dwarf. So I'm, I'm thinking traps or guardians. So what do I have here? So far, I know I've got some, some mines, some caves with spiders in them. I know I've got them near some elementals, and I know that that leads to some guardians or some chambers that are perhaps protecting the way before you get into this dwarven workshop. That's what I know right now. What might that look like? Something like this. That's it. This is, this is what I got right now. There is my map. It's not hard. Start out with a, a simple diagram. That's all you need right now. You don't need more than this to start. This isn't the final map. This is where your map begins. You got your spiders. They lead to elementals. Elementals lead to guardians. Guardians lead to workshop. That's it. That's that's all you need at this stage of the map. So let's let's move on. Let's move on to the next step of the map. You've kind of figured out the map's story. You know what the map needs to contain. The next step is kind of fleshing it out. At this stage, you're still not drawing barrels and crates and stuff like that. You're still not creating uh, specific things. What you're doing is fleshing out the diagram to turn it into space, to turn it into a series of chambers, not just it's a room and then a room and then a room and then a room. That's really boring. That's not a dungeon anyone's going to enjoy exploring. So what we've done so far is we've created all the things that we're pretty sure are going to be encounters in some way, shape, or form. They're going to be traps or monsters or something like that. 
But not every part of a map should be a fight. Some things should be puzzles. Some things should, and I don't mean literally puzzles. I mean, some of them should just be mysteries or things that have to be figured out. Some might be dangers or, or hazards that need to be overcome. Some might just be empty space because you don't want a lot of this, but you do want a little. You do want some areas that are just like, what's in there? Not much. Maybe some things that they could find, but there's no danger here. Maybe it's a place where they could just rest. Maybe it's a place where they could find a, a, a clue or something, but it's not really a critical part of the, the space. If every spot in your dungeon is an encounter, if every spot is critical, that does some weird things to the player psyche. They suddenly feel like if they don't unveil, uncover every part of the map, they might be missing something. And conversely, they might get gun shy about exploring a new area if they're not rested because they assume that every area has an encounter. So it's also at this point in time that you should be thinking about multiple ways to explore your map. There, there shouldn't just be one true path to get through. That's very railroady. Nobody is very excited about that kind of map. You should, um, but also be thinking about making sure that your story still flows if you open up other routes of exploration. So if there needs to be choke points, that's okay. It's okay for the adventure to be open and then funneled, opened and then funneled. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to make sure you mix it up. It, it has to all be there. So um, you're also gonna wanna start thinking about what other sorts of encounters or areas you might want to find um, that you can that you can add to this space. Things that make sense, right? If you were designing a keep, let's say, and uh, you got done and there was no kitchen, no dining room, all there was was like the throne room and guard rooms and a few bedrooms. Well, it wouldn't really feel like much of a keep if there's no kitchen and no 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 dining room and no storerooms or anything like that. Those don't have to be fights, but they have to be there for the space to make sense. So what you're doing is, uh, is you're trying to bring together um, all of the components necessary for the map to kind of start making sense. So once you've got these, your diagram is gonna start looking like a, a web, a, a web of spaces. Um, because what you're doing is just trying to define the other things that you need to have on the map. So I'm gonna bring it back around to, to our example here. Um, we know we've got spiders that lead to elementals, that lead to these guardians, that lead to the workshop. Great, no problem. But what do I what do I do with that? Well, the mine can't just be there's a shaft that leads to spiders and then that goes to elementals. Let's add some more stuff to it. Could the players skip the spiders? They absolutely could. This is a thing that I'm thinking about. They've been sent there to deal with the spiders. So if they don't go and deal with the spiders, they, their mission will be considered incomplete. So I can give them a different route. I could say, you know what, you can go a different way. Maybe you run into the elementals first, but that still leaves you with the spiders to deal with. And you know you're gonna to wanna to take care of those because those are the quest. So I'm a little open-ended on the front end here. And the moment I'm open-ended, I can start doing different things. Maybe there should be a, a part of the dungeon that's kind of caved in and collapsed. Could be something for future adventures. Could just be a hazard that the players have to get through. An area where the rock is unstable and any loud noises might cause the ceiling to collapse. Great. Maybe I could uh, add some fungus or something like that. Maybe I could start adding some natural hazards. Things that, um, things that if the players encounter them or mess with them, they might have to make poison saves or things like that in addition to whatever the spiders have on tap. Uh, you know, obviously with the spiders and whatnot, I'm going to look at webbing and things like that. That's not really something I need to worry about, but I could consider like putting in tunnels filled with webbing and stuff like that. Moving on, I, I have this, this chamber with elementals and at this, I know I want to funnel the adventure back in because once they get beyond this point, they're getting to the Dwarven Workshop and I want to make sure they go there. But that means I definitely want them to approach it from one vector because I want them to hit these guardians that are guarding the way in. Once they're in... I could open it back up again, but I need to have a funnel. So it's open, then I funnel through the elementals into the guardians. And once I'm back through the guardians, maybe it opens up and I start giving the players choices again. Once I'm in this workshop, you know, uh, I, there's a bunch of different ways I could approach it. I could add all the workshop to this map. I could add additional levels to the map. Maybe 
everything isn't going to fit. This is another interesting thing that happens when you reach this point of map creation, is you start going, wait, can I actually get all of this in the space that I have? And would it make more sense for me to have a nice, fresh, open area? You never know. There's lots of different ways you can play. But I'm also should be thinking about, okay, well, what about storage? What about, what about bathrooms? What about all sorts of things like that? Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things you can start to consider at this point in time. So, let's go back to the example and see what that might look like after, after this. Um, so, here we have, we've fleshed it out. We've, we've added a cave entrance because we need a spot where the players get into it. Uh, into the dungeon, and that leads to the spiders, but maybe instead of going straight to the spiders, you can go off and deal with some fungus. Maybe that leads to a cave-in that eventually leads to the elementals. Now, I want a funnel after that, so um, I, I could maybe add a chasm there, and we could lead into the guardians. The guardians, from there, you go into the workshop. Maybe the workshop goes into storage. And I suddenly start going, wow, maybe I want this mark workshop to be more than just one area. This map is already starting to feel full. So maybe instead, what, instead of the workshop, maybe what we're going to run into here is uh, the, uh, you know, the part of the workshop. And maybe there's another level after this. I don't know yet. We'll see how it goes. In some cases, as you build a map, you're going to be feeling things out. Um, and, you know, this is also where you should be, you know, refining your, your script for the adventure itself. So all of this is going to kind of play together. I like to build my maps as I go along, not save them for the end and then hope it all works out. I like to build it with my adventure hand in hand. So this is what our map looks like right now. Still, nothing special, just bubble diagrams and uh, some, some pathways uh, between chambers. But let's move on to the third step because this is where the map really starts taking shape. Because we've gotten to the point now where the map is a, a diagram that has some spaces in it, and we now start having a bunch of lines that start to indicate passages and chambers and stuff. We're, we're not quite to the point where we're going to draw every detail yet, but we, we should start considering how this map is actually going to look. So the next step is is putting in the details to allow the map to be used for an adventure, right? Primarily, this involves designing the encounter areas, but it might also include uh, any area where the physicality of the place is important to play. So puzzles, traps, obstacles, things that the players might have to make skill checks to overcome. Uh, you know, I was thinking about maybe in that elemental room, there's a giant chasm, so I definitely need a map of that area. Um, but I was probably going to need one anyway because the elementals. I'm kind of doing double duty here. I've got an interesting chasm space and uh, a place where we might fight some elementals. Sure, we can play with that. Uh, but this is also where I want to stress that if you are, you know, just running this for your home group, you, you can save yourself a whole lot of time by only really building what you need. Like, if I know there isn't a fight in the fungus room and there, it's just a chamber filled with fungus, do I need a map of that? Nah, not really. The bubble that just says fungus room in my notes is probably enough. I can ad-lib any detail I need. It's not like we're going to be rolling initiative in that space. And should, for some strange reason, a fight actually break out there or get dragged there, I can probably just doodle a, a room, put mushrooms in it, and call it good. It doesn't need to be incredibly detailed because the physicality of the place is mostly in its description and not really in how the miniatures move through it. But when it comes to combat spaces, those you're going to want to stop. That's where you're going to spend the majority of your mapping time, especially for this kind of level of a map. I, I, I like to think of maps in levels, right? You know, we've got our super basic bubble map. We've got our second web map of all of the encounter spaces. This is kind of the, the play map. This is the map that you can run a game off this map. To be honest, 95% of my maps for my home games look like this. They have this level of detail. So you're going to want to analyze all of your combat spaces. So what I like to do is stop, take a look at the combat spaces, and start thinking about how I can use that space to make the combat more interesting or play a pivotal role in the fight. There's lots of ways you can do this, right? Um, changing elevation, adding obstacles, adding tools and options that the players or the monsters might utilize to their advantage. 
right? The classic example is, oh, we're in a we're in a ballroom and there's a, a chandelier up above, and you know the the swashbuckler just happens to be standing next to the rope that leads up to that chandelier. You know they can cut that rope, ride the rope up into the sky, drop the chandelier on the the villainous Baron, and they can you know have an amazing time. And that was all because you drew where the chandelier was and where the rope was on the map. Those sorts of little details are really going to add a lot to your encounters. And really, every encounter, just about, should have some element of the area's physicality play an effect, or have an effect on the encounter. And that doesn't have to be a lot. In some cases, it could just be that the, the area is constrained, or that it's particularly wide open or funneled in some way. Maybe it's because there's just a set of stairs leading up to a ledge. That could be all it ha that that could be all it needs to make the encounter dynamic and interesting because the players have to think about how they interact with it. Nothing's more uh, boring is too strong of a word, but it's it's just too basic to have. Here's a monster; it's in the middle of the room. Run up and fight it. Your adventure deserves more than that. Um, this is also when drawing this map, you should be looking at all of these obstacles and thinking about which ones of them are going to need some rules. This you go back to your uh, you go back to your uh, notes and start saying, "Hey, that chandelier! How much damage does that do when somebody drops it on them?" Uh, you know, things like that are pivotal, right? Because they're going to save you time during the adventure. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this giant complex thing. You know, it could just be, yep, the chandelier falls. Anybody underneath it takes 3d6 slashing damage, but they get a basic reflex save. DC 18. Done. There. That's it. I now know everything I need to know if the chandelier drops on somebody. Um, so this is also a good time when you're building your map to take a step back and look at all of your encounters together, right? String them all together and start thinking about where it makes sense to mix things up, how to change things, right? If if you're doing something with... Uh, one of my favorite examples is there, there was an adventure I played quite some time ago where an entire wing of the dungeon was difficult terrain. And it was awful. This was pretty early in 3.5 era. But the entire thing was difficult terrain and it just made the entire adventure a slog. Every fight was slow and boring. And that was it. That was all that was special about them. There wasn't any varied terrain. There wasn't any varied tactics. Everything was difficult terrain. And it was really, really boring. Don't do that to your players. <laughs> Mix it up. Change how each encounter works. Maybe one has difficult terrain. Maybe one doesn't. Maybe one has water hazards. Maybe another one has a chasm. Maybe one has, you know, uh, just uh, narrow channels through a maze, right? There's so many different interesting ways you can play with the environment that you really should make sure that when you're looking at all of your encounters strung together that you're doing something varied, that you're mixing things up and not just relying on the same trick over and over and over again. I, I, I'm as guilty of it as the next GM, but it's something that this is the point where building these these maps and these encounters, you can kind of take a step back and say, hey, you know, maybe I should figure out a different way to approach this. This is too similar to the encounter right before it. This is also a point where looking at the map, you want to start thinking about, hey, did I remember to give them a place where they can rest safely? Did I Have I given them a place... If, if the way this map is built, are they really being encouraged to face four hard encounters in a row? Is that too much? Have I built something that, by its very nature of how it is constructed, the players are in trouble? I had some challenge with this writing the adventure, my adventure for the Emerald Spire Super Dungeon, because the players kind of get locked into the, the level that I designed. And as a result, I had to be very careful balancing out the number of encounters they might face and giving them opportunities to find some rest if they need it because i couldn't dictate what condition they would be in when they walked into this dungeon but they rapidly would find themselves locked in this level if they interacted with it so that was a that was a challenge right and that made me consider the map and the encounters in a different light So once you've taken these steps and you start, this is the point in time where you're going to want to actually start drawing walls, drawing features, maybe giving yourself a sense of scale by, you know, just 
doodling at, uh, a, a grid on it. Of course, if you have a piece of graph paper, this is the point where you might want to go over to a piece of graph paper and start creating rooms, right? That way you have a sense of how big they are and how they're going to start fitting together. Um, you know, use your space. Expand out. Uh, build what's going to make sense uh, for you, for your space, for the number of players you have. Make sure at this point in time as well to consider how big your monsters are and how big the players are and whether or not they all fit in the space together. Nothing is more frustrating than playing an adventure and being like, cool, we're in this 10 foot by 10 foot room fighting four 10 foot by 10 foot ogres. Somehow. <laughs> it, it can be a big challenge. So, uh, you know, and, and all of it comes down to good mapping. So as you do this, um, you should be able to start drawing features in like, oh, I know I want webs here and I know I've got a chasm here and maybe there's a bridge across it. And oh, those elementals, maybe they have some crystals. I'm kind of bringing this back around to my to my example. Um, but what you're trying to do is give yourself enough details that if you need to recreate this map on a battle map, you have the details to do it. Um, you also know the location of all the bits and pieces in the, in the encounter. That way you know what to stat up, you know how they work, you know how they function, you know where the players can go, you know where the monsters can go. You can even start putting the monsters on the map or detailing where they might live. All of these things are driving you to the point where you have a map that you can run the adventure off of because that's the end of this step. Um, it's, it's about envisioning each encounter, drawing an interesting space, adding the features that you've thought about, you know, being like, hey, this seems like a good feature to add, uh, and finding space for it and figuring out how those pieces relate. So, going back to our example here, we have a cave entrance. We talked about that. That leads to the spiders. Now, the spiders we know are the first fight. So I've put a ledge in there and there's webbing all over the room. That's probably enough for the spider fight. These spiders have weird elemental energies around them. So they're already dangerous enough. They are interesting. But adding a ledge, especially one that they can easily climb up and climb down off the sides, uh, is, is really fun and really kind of interesting. Now, these spiders are maybe only medium. I don't think they're large. So that space may be big enough for, you know, three or four spiders to attack the party. Um, and that's kind of it. That's all I need. You notice I didn't draw a map for the fungus or the cave-in because ultimately these aren't a thing that I expect there to be uh, an encounter in. Now, I might want to draw a map of the cave-in area if there's something about the space that is like positioning would be critical, like this is where the rocks fall. I might want to draw that map. But if I don't, if it's just the entire area has the ceiling kind of rumble and drop rocks if the players make too much noise, it affects everybody, I don't really need a map for that. Now, I talked about that elemental space. This is a big space. I, I decided, you know what, maybe it's big. I've got a chasm in there. I've got elementals on one side of it. There's crystals coming out of the wall. Maybe they're glowing with red hot heat from the workshop. Um, you know, I start playing around with that and I end up with an interesting space. It's got a chasm on one side. If I put, if I decide to put earth elementals in here instead of maybe fire elementals, uh, they might be able to push people into the chasm because the players have to approach them from the side. And if they come out of the walls, they might be able to push them into the chasm. So I've automatically got a really interesting dynamic encounter there. Um, then of course there's getting across the chasm and we get over to these guardians. I still don't quite know what the guardians are or how they work, but I've decided, you know what, let's put four statues in the corner. Um, I'm detailing out a trap and stuff. Maybe it's the sort of thing where if they do the wrong thing or step in the wrong squares, um, they trigger these guardians. Once again, I can go back to my, uh, encounter notes and figure out how that's going to work. But this might be the sort of encounter where they just get mobbed from all sides. That can be interesting. Maybe there's a puzzle element here too that I haven't decided upon. But again, that's probably all I need in terms of a map is here are the guardians. This is where they are. And there's a puzzle I can describe on the floor. Uh, from there, we go to like a storage area and then we get to the workshop. And maybe this isn't the whole workshop. I've added a stair. Uh, looking at how much space I have on this map, I probably don't have enough to get the full workshop in here. So maybe this is just the, the dwarf's personal chambers and his workshop was is down below. So I've added a staircase going down and this is the start of the workshop where you finally get into the dwarf's lair. Now this, for many games, is going to be more than enough. That's all you need. 
I, I wouldn't need anything else. I could easily run that adventure off that map alone. There's plenty there. I have all the details I need. I can embellish a bit on the fly if I need to. I can refine some areas and add, add a few more details. I don't need every corridor. I don't need every corner of this thing mapped out. Usually. That's not always the case, though. So let's go and talk about polish. So sometimes you need to go one step further and you need to design all the spaces. This happens. There's a lot of different ways it can happen. Maybe it's just something you want to do. You're enjoying it. You're enjoying the creative exercise and you just want to do it. Fine. No problem. Uh, you know, maybe you want to draw all the rest of the chambers. Great. Maybe you've got a big play mat you want to put out on the table and you don't just want a bunch of disconnected bubbles. Instead, you want to draw the whole thing. That way your players can explore it. You can cover up pieces of it with pieces of paper and reveal them as they go along. I have seen plenty of GMs do this very successfully, but that requires you to design the entire dungeon. No problem. Um, maybe instead you are playing on a VTT, like many of us are, a virtual tabletop right now. Uh, if you are playing on a virtual tabletop and you want to, you, you, there's a decent chance you want to build out the whole space, even if they're not going to necessarily have a fight in all of them, because moving their token around that space is one of the key ways that they visualize what's going on. There's another option as well, and maybe that's that you're planning on publishing this adventure. And in that, the sketch that you're working on may be the thing that you are turning over to our cartographer. Uh, you know, a pro that you've paid money to, to do the map up in a nice final version. One of the things I've learned in my years uh, spent in the industry is that the key to a great map in the adventure is uh, certainly due in large part to a skilled cartographer, but an equally important part is a good map turnover that has exciting areas in it. A good cartographer cannot make a boring map exciting. They can make a boring map pretty, but they can't make a boring map exciting. And as a result, you might have a really pretty, really boring map. I think we all can think of examples of those. So having, you know, if you want an exciting, engaging encounter and adventure area, it starts with the map and it's sketch. Now, of course, there's the final thing, which is maybe you want to be the, the person who does that final map yourself. Maybe you want to polish up your cartography skills and become that pro. There's lots of levels of polish that you can apply here, and each one is going to get you closer and closer to kind of what I consider a publishable map. At its most basic, you can continue to add the details and complete the sketches just like you did in the previous step. So, you know, how I kind of just doodled out the spider den and I doodled out the area with the crystals. You can just keep doing that and doodle in all the other areas. That is, in fact, how you end up with a good map that you can hand over to a freelancer to turn into a final published map. That is quite literally how I do most of my maps that I hand over to freelancers. Um, I will doodle them out until I have, you know, kind of a complete sketch of the space, leaving Nothing to chance. I don't just leave a circle and be like, there's a room over here. You figure it out. Um, you know, you got to detail out all the areas and stuff. <laughs> we have certainly received maps over the years that are just like, here's a bunch of bubbles. I don't know. Uh, and we have to redraw them. So, um, so you know, the, 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 the most basic thing you can do is just continue the thing you did for the previous step. Just do it for the non-combat areas. Easy enough to do. Um, the next thing you can do is, um, go into each area and start adding basic bits of scenery, right? You know, oh, uh, you know, to give it detail, like, oh, here's some barrels and here's some crates. Like it doesn't take much work to kind of go in to, uh, you know, to do a, a search on Google for cartography symbols, uh, for fantasy, uh, RPGs and get a great, um, many of examples of like, this is the symbol you use for a chest. This is the symbol you use for a door. This is the symbol you use for a barrel, for a bed. And you can just start adding those to your map. I actually, you could actually even see a few of those on my previous sketch map because they're second nature to me at this point. Oh, a rectangle with a C in it is a chest. Uh, a bed is a rectangle with like a pillow drawn on it and a slash to represent the folded over blanket. I'm just used to seeing those so much that I draw them automatically now. 
But adding those level of details is going to get your map the next step up. Now it's starting to, now I have a good sense of everything that's in the space, even if it's not relevant to the encounters. I'm going to draw these mushrooms in here. I'm going to draw rocks for where the cave-in is. It's just extra levels of detail. Now if you want to take it to the next level of polish, the next thing you want to start doing is looking at using some artistic flair. Uh, by using shading, hatching, by using line depth and uh, line weight. Um, this is this is one of those great tricks that, uh, that I, I will share with all of you when it comes to map drawing. Line weight is everything. Line weight is how you convey information detail. So I usually use a heavy line weight for walls, a medium line weight for obstructions in a space, and a light line weight for detail work. Three levels, and I get everything I need. So um, I will use that heavy line to indicate where all the walls of the space are, where the solid, you cannot go through these barriers. I'll use that middle weight for things that are like, hey, this is an object you have to interact with. Like, it's a bed or a crate or a table. It has some weight, some heft to it that you, you're you telling the players, this is something you can interact with. It's something you can move. It's something you can climb on, but you can't just walk through it as if it's not there. And then I'll use a very light line weight to do like the details on the chest, patterning on the floors, stuff like that. That, uh, that stuff is stuff that's just like, that's clearly an embellishment. The players know that they can mostly ignore it, but it helps them visualize the dungeon that they are seeing. That's the trick that almost every good cartographer uses. It's all about line weights, shading, that sort of thing. You start to learn that there are a lot of traditional symbols for like hatching in walls. Like, oh, this is a dungeon wall, so it has like bubbles, like cobblestone built into the wall. Oh, it's a cavern wall, so it's got like cross hatching on it. These things take time to master and, and learn how to do right, but if you practice them, you will pick them up. Uh, they are they are a, a good skill to have if you're going to be drawing a lot of maps. Now, let's say you don't have time, <laughs> right? And uh, you don't have time to practice, and you, you're not really much of, um, you know, artistic skill is not something you've really explored. Um, so... There are a lot of other ways you can get at good maps, especially if you're not looking to publish them, um, but instead are just looking to use them, but you want them to look really nice. Uh, and for that, there's cartography software out there. I'm not gonna go into it. There's plenty out there. They are uh, of varying levels of, of ease of use. The one thing I've learned about those softwares is that some of them are very simple to uh, use and, and make use of, but getting a really good looking map out of them takes a lot of practice and really learning the ins and outs of the software. And a lot of them are like CAD based. So you have to kind of understand how layering works and uh, they've gotten better over the years, but they do take some work to learn. If you're playing on a VTT, a virtual tabletop, many of them have map packs and map tiles that you can use to build your dungeon. Map packs usually aren't gonna get you exactly the dungeon that you envision, but map tiles will, because you can use those to build your own dungeon. Which of course brings me around to the fact that I'm about to release some map tiles. So uh, I actually used my map tiles to finish out the, the example dungeon that we've been talking about up to this point. So with map tiles, you could basically get a kit of parts doors, walls, windows, barrels, crates, all sorts of stuff, and you can assemble them into the dungeon that you want. And depending on the style and the quality, you can have a dungeon that looks really great for your players to uh, experience, and it reflects your dungeon and what you need it to be. So uh, let me go and, and, and show you the example here. Um, so as you recall, we got our spider dungeon uh, with elementals and guardians leading to a workshop. And I built the whole thing using my tiles. These are called blue map tiles uh, because they're styled after the old uh, blue maps that you saw in classic uh, uh, adventure uh, environments. And as you can see here, we've got the kind of spider haunt dungeon over here with its ledge and cobwebs uh, kind of 
covering up the place that leads up into the uh, area with the uh, elementals and the chasms. And you can see I've got crystals growing out of the walls and out of the floor. That leads to uh, a chasm with a bridge over it that I decided, you know what? I'm going to make it broken so that it's harder to cross. You know, no getting across that without making a skill check or two. We've got the cavern over here with the fungus. Uh, that might be interesting to explore. I left a little nook in the back that maybe I could tuck some treasure into to uh, reward them for exploring that area. We've got the area that's caved in. I decided to minimize this when I was building out the full map. They can pass by it if they want, but if they want to go back there and explore, maybe it leads to an entire different area of the dungeon. Then we get across the way over to where the guardians are, and this is where I use the map tiles to really make something interesting because I created... Um, a, uh, a large uh, kind of area with interesting floor tiling uh, that I could then use to kind of create my trap about those center areas and how they could be used to unlock the gateway that leads deeper in. And then, of course, I went in and built the storeroom. I decided to put a trap in there, which uh, if I was playing this on Roll20, which is where this map pack is from, um, I could hide that until the players walk into it. You can see it just uh, in the storeroom there. And that leads into the workshop with the bed and a fireplace and a table off in the corner and stairs going down below. So, you know, we went from this to this to this to this it's not bad now admittedly drawing all of this by hand would take several 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 hours i want to say that building this with map tiles took me about an hour maybe a little less uh, about 45 minutes or so to build the entire thing to to lay down all the tiles to get them in order to get them to where i need to be that's actually a great little segment i, I like that let's see that again uh from a basic diagram to a bubble map of connected spaces to a series of encounter areas that we could run the adventure from to a finished polished map that we could display to players proudly. After all this, you might just have a map with a, you know, rich detail that you are proud to show to your group, that you are excited to get them to run around and play upon. A map that contributes just as much to your adventure as the actions of your players, as the monologues of your villains. Well, I think that about wraps it up. That about covers everything I have to cover on maps here today. If you're uh, excited to uh, uh, you know, get cracking and build maps of your own, uh, I'll, I'll do my one brief plug here. Uh, my map tile sets are about to go live on Roll20 uh, on Monday, June 15th, 2020, uh, they will be live on Roll20. You will be able to find them under Blue Maps. That's the name of the, the maps. There are two sets. One is the cavern set and one is the dungeon set. The map that I built here today uses bits from both. Uh, each one has like 70 tiles in it. So uh, check them out uh, if you're on Roll20. I'm currently investigating uh, getting those onto some other virtual tabletops, but uh, some of those are a little bit more challenging. So I'm working on it, but we'll see how it goes. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, I have an entire series of videos on YouTube uh, talking about game design uh, and game mastering and making cool player characters and all that sort of stuff. So I, I, I highly recommend you go check those out. Uh, you can find those on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash Jason Bullman. And for that matter, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Twitch, all of those places at backslash Jason Bullman. This tutorial was given live in my Twitch and we're about to go into Q&A, but I cut that off for the YouTube channel. Um, if you are interested in taking part in these seminars live, you can always join me at 4 p.m. on Saturdays Pacific time on my Twitch channel. That's twitch.tv backslash Jason Bullman. Thank you for watching, everybody, and we will see you next time.